There are coasters out there that everyone likes or loves, and there are coasters that everybody hates, with the exception of the few oddballs that like getting beaten up. This makes sense. We all have to live within the confines of the human body, and we experience forces in a similar way. But then there are the coasters that draw a completely different reaction from everybody. You get some people who love them, and you get some people who despise them. It's really quite a phenomenon. Today, I want to identify those coasters in the US and let you know where I come down on the divide. These are America's 15 most polarizing coasters. I'm focusing on America and the coasters that I've ridden in this video. But there is one coaster in Europe that stands out as very polarizing, and that's Port Aventura's Furious Baco. The people who love this coaster really love it, but most others think it's rough and painful. I also want to talk about other coasters that I wrote down during my research, but I didn't include on this list. Silver Bullet at Knott's Berry Farm, Grizzly at King's Dominion, Apocalypse at Six Flags Magic Mountain, Hollywood Rip Ride Rocket at Universal Orlando, Blue Hawk at Six Flags Over Georgia, White Lightning at Fun Spot Orlando, Boulder Dash at Lake Compounds, and Cheetah Hunt at Busch Gardens Tampa. These have their fans and their detractors, but are not quite top 15 material. Number 15, SNS Free Spins at various Six Flags parks. Some may hate these because they've been cloned so many times, but that's not really fair. I fall into this trap sometimes, especially with the Batman the Ride clones, but I try to judge a ride on how good it is, and I'm definitely a fan. I love the out of control and random flipping on these, and even though they're super short rides, I always have a lot of fun on them. Other people just don't like the free spin element. Either it makes them uncomfortable, or it makes them sick. Let's all hope that Airtime Mike's dreams come true, and his home park of King's Dominion gets that rumored free spin for 2021. I love 40 free spins! That is great! I couldn't be any happier! Number 14, American Eagle at Six Flags Great America. This Intamin wooden coaster has been the topic of conversation lately regarding its future. Apparently, it'll need new trains within a couple years, and the park needs to make a decision on whether to turn it into a hybrid or buy new trains and allow it to continue as is. The split on this decision seems to fall on how people like the ride right now. American Eagle still has its fans that think it's a fun, long, solid wooden coaster with a lot of history and want to see it be preserved. Others think it's outdated and rough and think its time is up. I fall more towards the latter. I didn't have great rides on this the last few years, so I've never really been a fan. I think a second RMC at Great America would be a little awkward, but I wouldn't be upset if American Eagle was scrapped or overhauled. Number 13, The Legend at Holiday World. When this CCI wooden coaster opened in 2000, it was a big deal. This was the park's big follow-up to the Raven, which was so good that it won a few golden ticket awards for best wooden coaster. Legend was a very different ride focusing less on negative Gs and more on laterals and an out of control feeling. A lot of people still love this coaster. Maybe not as much as Voyage, but at least equally if not more than Raven. Others want this to become Holiday World's first RMC conversion. When I mention the legend in my videos about possible RMCs, the comments are full of people either defending it as it currently stands or they agree that it's too rough and something needs to be done about it. I'm definitely in the camp of something needs to be done about it. Holiday World has tried to keep this running well in recent years with some retracking, but this coaster just isn't for me. Number 12, Apollo's Chariot at Busch Gardens Williamsburg. The original B&M Hyper begs the question, is it an elite hyper? You'll find plenty of answers on either side of that debate. I used to think it was one of the better steel coasters in the country until my last few rides in 2019. Now I think it's the weakest of the B&M hypers. The airtime on the newer hypers is so much better than Apollo, and I think I was blown away by how great it was as it was my first B&M hyper back in 2008, especially considering that we don't have a good hyper on the west coast. But in comparison to the rest, it's weak. I'm not alone with that opinion, but so many people will defend it. Maybe they got a better ride where the train was running faster, or maybe they appreciate the great secluded setting. But as of now, I'm not the biggest fan of Apollo's Chariot anymore. Though as Theme Park Crazy says, you can't go wrong with a B&M Hyper. Number 11, The Boss at Six Flags St. Louis. Another CCI Woody cracks this list, and this one is massive. It's actually hard to believe how huge the structure is, and it has a very unique layout. After the first drop, you hit a straightaway and then dive down even more. It's so fast. Speed is definitely its main focus. 
positives, negatives, and laterals not so much. It's just a speed machine and it also has a great secluded setting. This is appealing to a lot of people. It has plenty of fans. I see the CCI monstrosity and all I can think of is RMC. Speed is great, but when the track runs that rough, it's not all that fun. And minus the negative, positive, and lateral Gs, for me, this thing is just rough and boring. I still think more people dislike this more than they like it, but those boss fans are pretty hardcore, and they make themselves known in any debate over what the next RMC conversion should be. Number 10. Nitro at Six Flags Great Adventure Does this B&M Hyper have airtime? Of course it does. Why do people say it doesn't? I hear it all the time. Now there's one thing that really hurts Nitro's standing in the coaster community, and it stands 181 feet tall on the other side of the park. El Toro's airtime is world class, and Nitro's floater is run of the mill. On my last trip to Great Adventure, I rode Nitro once and I didn't feel too bad about it because I figured if I wanted more airtime, I'd just go over and ride El Toro and get the good stuff. This is too bad for Nitro, because as far as B&M Hypers go, I think it's middle of the road. And since I love B&M Hypers, it makes it a top 30 ride for me. I'd love to have this at my home park, and I think it's a perfect supporting coaster for Great Adventure. You can have a great time just going over there to ride El Toro, Nitro, and Jersey Devil, and I'd probably do that on every visit if it was my home park. I think it gets an unfair shake because of El Toro, but it's still an excellent coaster. Number 9. Steel Force at Dorney Park Morgan Hypers deliver a tall and long ride with lots of speed, but in terms of forces, it's questionable. Some people would go as far as to call these Morgan Hypers glorified mine trains. From my most recent visit to Dorney Park, I'd tend to agree. So many airtime hills, so little airtime. My opinion isn't rare, but not everyone would agree. Steel Force has a ton of fans who swear that they get solid airtime on this thing. If they do, that's awesome for them. Maybe it runs better in certain weather conditions and its fans ride it when it's warmed up and fast, and its detractors rode it when it's cold and slow. I gave it a shot in the front and the back, and I was pretty disappointed. Number 8. Valraven at Cedar Point This is one of the weirdest coasters out there. Most coaster enthusiasts hate this ride, and they do it for a couple reasons. One, it has vest restraints that take away from the airtime that other dive coasters enjoy over their vertical drops. Two, it's at Cedar Point, and there's a certain standard of coaster that this park can accept. Gatekeeper seems to have the same fate as Valraven because of this standard. Big and graceful B&Ms need not apply when it comes to Cedar Point. Valraven is a GP magnet and it draws some of the longest lines in the park. I rode this right after it opened and a few times since, and I've never had a bad ride on it. I admit that the vests do take away from the airtime, and that's unfortunate, but I still love the stomach dropping freefall feeling on those drops and I love the setting over the pathways as well as the inversions. Most of the time, I come off Valraven more satisfied than when I come off Maverick. That's just the truth. I have some people in the community that agree with me that Valraven is a great ride, but most others look down on it with disgust, not even putting it on their list of top 10 coasters at the park. Give me the 223 foot dive coaster if you don't want it. Number seven, Magnum XL200 at Cedar Point. The original Hypercoaster just had its 30th birthday, and just like all other old aero coasters, this one has a little jank. The jerky aero transitions are strong with this one, and the lap bars aren't the most comfortable out there. This causes a lot of disdain towards Magnum, mainly among the general public, but I've also seen enthusiasts disapprove of how it's running nowadays. When I rode it back in 2002, it was my number three coaster. I forgot how good it was until the last few years when I've gotten a few more rides and I've lifted it all the way back into my top 20. I'm a huge Magnum fan, and the last run of Airtime Hills provides some great sustained ejector in the back and probably the strongest jolts of ejector airtime I've ever felt in the front. Magnum is a national treasure, and I cringe whenever there's talk about removing it for something else. Number six, Raging Bull at Six Flags Great America. This B&M Hyper is unique because it doesn't have a drawn out hyper coaster layout. Instead, it's a twister and it gets looked down upon for this fact. When you think Hyper Twister, usually you think of Goliath, which sucks, but Raging Bull is different. I think the drawn out Hyper layouts you'll find on Intimidator and Behemoth are boring and uninspired. Raging Bull has a lot to offer, not just airtime hill after airtime hill, but it still has plenty of good airtime moments. It's a long enough ride to incorporate a lot of twists and turns and a helix into its layout without sacrificing too much airtime. This is my favorite ride at Great America, 
and I don't think it deserves the title of worst B&M hyper that often gets thrown around. In fact, I think that only Diamondback and Mako are better, and it finds a spot in my overall top 10. Number 5. The Beast at Kings Island This ride is all about expectations. I don't think anyone believes that it's a great thrilling coaster, but it offers so much more. It's an adventure out into the woods on a track that spans over 7,000 feet long. It has a lot of shallow drops, straight track, and trim breaks. It also has some tunnels and a crazy helix finale off the second lift. It's a true legend in the coaster world, and it's been so for over 40 years. Because of its lofty status, a lot of people go in thinking it's going to be a lot better ride than it is, and they leave disappointed and thinking the ride is overrated. If you go in thinking that it's not going to be super thrilling, but appreciate its setting and its length, you're going to come off a lot more satisfied. Because not everyone comes in with the same expectations, everyone has a vastly different judgment. This is one of the few coasters I don't have a strong opinion of. I like the beast for what it is, but it's nowhere near the list of my favorite wooden coasters. But I do love riding it multiple times every time I'm at Kings Island. Number 4. Millennium Force at Cedar Point Speaking of legendary coasters, Millennium Force was the best of the best when it debuted in 2000 as the world's first giga coaster. But it's not a perfect ride, and sometimes it feels like people treat it like it is. The Golden Ticket Awards have given Millennium Force the honor of best steel coaster something like nine times over the years, even when other steel coasters have come along and clearly have surpassed it. Given all of the awards and the accolades, people who have ridden all of the more modern steel coasters may come off the ride thinking that it wasn't all that great. It used to be my number two coaster, and at this point, it's nearly fallen out of my top 20. Top 20 is still great, and it's still my second favorite coaster at Cedar Point, but I'm not gonna pretend it's one of the best steel coasters in the world. There are people out there that just don't like this coaster because it's full of overbanks and it has hardly any airtime. Others love it for its great drop, its speed, its setting, and its length, and they put it in their personal top 10 or top five lists. It's an epic ride, but it's not all that well-rounded, so keep that in mind while riding it. It was the Giga Coaster prototype, so it's not gonna stand up as well over time compared to the newer models. Number three, Viper at Six Flags Magic Mountain. This Aero Mega Looper is now 30 years old and it has the stats and the layout that stand the test of time. 188 feet with seven inversions over nearly 4,000 feet of track. The thing that doesn't stand the test of time is that janky Aero track and the bad transitions. Viper is not a smooth, graceful ride and lots of people hate it because it's rough and painful. I love Viper because I'm tall enough to avoid the head banging, and I love the speed and the intense elements, as well as the great first drop and the hang time on the final corkscrews. But for so many people, the pain from those jerky elements is too much to handle and they just stay away. Viper is a lot more popular with enthusiasts than with the general public, but there are even a lot of enthusiasts who will take a hard pass on Viper. Number two, X2 at Six Flags Magic Mountain. Viper's next door neighbor also checks in high on this list. This is one of the few coasters where enthusiasts will have a completely different opinion of the ride from one day to the next. The seat you choose is important in terms of intensity and roughness and can drastically change your ride experience. All of the other coasters on this list will have opinions vary from person to person, but this is the only one where the pendulum swings wildly back and forth for the same person. Since this is at my home park, I've ridden it enough to get a good feel of how the ride actually is and I love it. It's my number 11 overall coaster, but for someone who comes in from out of town and rides this once or twice, it's a total crapshoot whether they'll love it or hate it, and if they come back later, that opinion will likely change. Number 1. Skyrush at Hershey Park The biggest bone of contention on this Intamin Hypercoaster is the lap bars. It's over 200 feet tall, it has a solid layout that most people would agree is fine, but the way the lap bars affect your body will make or break the ride. For some people, myself included, these lap bars were sent to Hershey Park straight from the factory of hell and designed by Satan himself. For others, they're not a big deal and they can still enjoy the fast and aggressive layout without much, if any, pain. Because this ride is so good on its own, those who aren't bothered by the lap bars consistently put this ride in their top 10. But for me, even accounting for how good Skyrush could be, it barely finds a spot in my top 200. Whenever I talk about Skyrush, I get plenty of comments on both sides of this issue, and I'm convinced that this is the most polarizing coaster in America. So that's a wrap for this list. Let me know in the comments below which coasters are the most polarizing in your opinion, and if any of the coasters from this list trigger you in any way. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.